Welcome to the My Curious Colleague Podcast with your host, me, Denise Veneri. We'll be talking all things consumer relations with a focus on consumer product goods organizations and the brand specialist and analyst roles and responsibilities. So if you like CPGs like I like CPGs, marketing, insights, and caring deeply for your consumers, well, take a listen. Well, hello, my curious colleagues. As promised, we're continuing on with our series of interviews, highlighting that that sweet spot between the consumer relations function as they intersect with other cross-functional partners in the organization. So today, my guest is my colleague, Marcia Young, and we'll be discussing collaborating with the consumer insights function. Let me tell you a little bit about Marcia Young. I've known her for many years. She currently is a senior advisor of consumer intelligence at Flavor Wiki, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, later on. She recently retired from Mondelez International, where she was senior director of consumer science. Now, Marcia had prior roles, uh, including many global leadership positions in consumer and sensory science at a bevy of CPG companies, which of course, you know, I love, and they are Kraft Foods, Cadbury, Campbell Soup Company, where I got to to know Marcia very well, Sara Lee Bakery, and the Gerber Products Company. She's also had, has held some leadership positions in product and process development while at Sara Lee and Campbell. So her talents are across many different functions. She is a graduate of the University of Rhode Island with a BS degree in food science and technology and has spent the last 40 years in the food industry. So hello, Marcia, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, Denise. Uh, Happy to be here. So I mentioned that you and I had worked together at Campbell Soup Company, and specifically we worked together on the Women of R&D Affinity Group, and that's really where I got to see your leadership style in action which I might describe as the first time I saw really a leader that led with both their head and their heart. So wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your leadership over the years and how that's evolved and and maybe some specific tips for the audience, which uh, spans some new folks and some seasoned professionals as well. Sure, we'll do. Um, so, you know, I would say um, just even as a teenager, um, y- you know, leadership can be part of your your journey. Um, you know, in high school, I was the captain of our tennis team. At the university level, um, I actually led um, the flag corps as part of the University of Rhode Island uh, marching band. They didn't have a core at that point. And so I went to them to say, hey, you know, I have this vision about, um, you know, having this as, as part of the band and, and started that. Um, and so then when I started my career as um, an early scientist, I even began to volunteer in leadership roles um, at that point. So I guess on the young side, just to remind people that you don't have to be a manager of people in order to be a leader. Um, there are things that you can do. There are organizations you can join. There are clubs. There are things even within your company you can volunteer to lead to learn some of those skills. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough um, at Gerber, I was a manager of the sensory evaluation function. And when I left there and went to Sara Lee, um, we actually were in the process of changing over a lot of leadership within R and D, and so we had a leadership coach. Um, so I had a personal leadership coach when I was at Sara Lee, and um, you know, one of the things that he instilled in me was that you know a company can buy the technical skills, you can buy the the skills, you can go out there and search people, but it's how you put together your interpersonal skills and your technical skills that are going to dictate your success in an organization. And it really is about relationships and not just the relationships you may have with your boss or your peers, but it is the relationships that you form with your employees. 
And, and actually, at that point in time, I actually had contracts with each of my um, direct reports. You know, what's important to know about me that's not obvious? What's in, then I would learn about them, what's important to them that's not obvious? What are things that we are going to contract with one another about how we're going to work together? Um, and it really opened up very positive communication channels um, that, you know, things didn't fester, things didn't uh, wait, you know, until something went wrong and that our goal was to be good together um, and to both grow and, and develop. Um, and I've kept that in mind as I've moved from senior leadership roles from, you know, manager to director to senior director, to a vice president role um, at Cadbury. It's just always something that um, I've really uh, held on to. Uh, and that knowing that the relationships you have with people, because, you know, in reality, you're not going to force anybody to do anything. It's about working together and having a common goal and a vision and then inspiring them to have that same vision and so that you're working together. Um, to both grow and develop. Yeah, love that. I like the idea of the of the contract too. You know, it just sounds so mutually beneficial. Was that from the leadership coach? That idea, yeah. huh? Yes, and that was probably yes. you know a good what twenty years ago. Yes. Okay. Yep. Nice. Yep. Really. And and the other thing is that. Um, I'm a big fan of um, social styles. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that. It was a Wilson learning model, which, um, you know, it's interesting in terms of how you view yourself versus how others view you. And so, you know, there's a little questionnaire that others would fill out about you. And it helps to understand just on a natural basis, what is your interpersonal style and how that might change or shift when you're under stress. So mm. I'm an amiable person. I am someone who, you know, likes to work to get to consensus or agreement. Mm -hmm. I don't, my first instinct is to not go to conflict. I will try to avoid that at all costs. I will try to work with others to get to that common ground. Um, but when I get under stress, then I kind of go more analytical. It's like, okay, I want to see the data. I want to see the numbers. I really need to know what's going on here if I get yeah. under stress. And so it's important that the people that work for me know that style and how right. it is that I naturally am, um, what are the things that I value, and then also being able to detect, okay, when is she under stress? And also for you with your employee, right? Because if you have very opposite styles, it's important that it's, you know that. Um, that, you know, it isn't, uh, again, that tension and conflict. Yeah. And I think it underscores a basic tenet of leadership that I've kind of believed in. I learned that from one of my bosses where it's like every style or every, you know, every way of leading with one of your um, employees is, is going to be different because you're, you're human beings and you have different needs and wants and and reactions to stress and things like that. And it really needs to be almost customizable if you're really looking for that, you know, win-win relationship. Yeah, great, yep. great advice. Yep. for. And, and, and I would, I'll just add one other thing. What's interesting is, you know, in your career, if you need to influence someone, if you need to influence a higher up, maybe mm -hmm. you want money, maybe you want a lab, maybe, you know, <laughs> um, you want to be on a project team. Um, right. You have to understand their style because if they're the person who's kind of a, you know, goes from the gut and is kind of a feel person mm -hmm. and you go in there with pages of data, yeah. they're just going to like glaze over, right? But at right. the same time, if you need to influence someone who is very data driven, you can't go in there and just say, well, I'd like to do this. And, you know, I just, I just know I'm right, right? I right. have this feeling that it's all going to work out. Mm, it's not going to work so well. So yeah. it really is also, um, as a leader, how do you influence others? Uh, and understanding them will be important. Perfect. Let's get now back into some of that uh, working together, ways of working. Um, so I remember 
when I was leading the reporting team at in uh, consumer relations, uh, you know, we had a series of reports we'd produce on a particular cadence each month or week or quarterly, what have you. And my favorite one is the tracking of new products reports, because I thought it was so fun that consumer relations could be in that position for that, you know, very early read on new products. Um, although I used to view it and still promote it as, you know, qualitative in, in nature. So help me understand, you know, has, has that changed what, the definitions there? So there's, you know, well, I've got two questions here. We'll take one at a time. So for your audience and for me, can you please share like the current definition between that difference uh, between qualitative data and quantitative data? And if you have a juicy example of, mm -hmm. you know, each of those, that would be great. And then I'll come back for my second question. <laughs> okay, fabulous. Um, so those two definitions and those two types of research, um, you know, have been around forever. Um, you know, when you say qualitative, it is going to be small numbers of people that you're gathering, you know, data from. Um, but it's going to be a lot more of down deep, right? Talking to fewer people, but really going in depth and understanding why and how. Um, it's about hypothesis building um, and, you know, really understanding that person as an individual and then doing that, you know, multiple times. But typically you wouldn't run, um, you know, uh, analytics on that and statistics uh, on that because you don't have enough numbers or in, as we might say. Conversely, on the quantitative side, you're getting lots of data. You know, it's the survey data that you typically see. It's your central location tests. It's your home use tests where you get ends of, you know, 50, 100, sometimes, you know, 300, 500 people. And you're taking all of those individuals and working and analyzing that data to understand the similarities and the differences, you know, likes and dislikes, you know, why some products might perform better than another, what are those relationships between ingredients and so forth. So on a very simple scale, it's qualitative is more like the focus groups where you're talking to individuals or one-on-one -on -one interviews and you're building hypothesis and you're really getting down in, in depth where on the quantitative side, it's larger numbers, and there are some kind of, you know, surveys that you're doing. Now, I will just couch that a little bit, because today there is so much going on with regards to, you know, digital, digital transformations, um, chatbots. So, you know, yep. there's technology out there that, you, you know, it's a chatbot ha ha having a conversation with, you know, now you could have a, a conversation with three or 400 people with the chatbot, um, and you could come back and, and analyze that. So it, even that is kind of changing with the use of technology and, and voice recognition and being able to take words and things that people say, you know, if they just answer a question on an open end or you're in a conversation and you ask a question, um, you know, and you do that with multiple people, you can also begin to gather um, you know, and analyze that as data because of word recognition and patterns of voice and so forth. Right. So technology is really also changing the way we think about those two things. Yeah. Ex excellent. Uh, excellent point. Would you, would you still say though, that consumer relations data, you know, that's incoming doesn't represent the U S population and it could be the end could be less than 50. We're still saying that is qualitative or are we still sort of putting that in that box or is it, is it a little bit different yeah. now based on what I, I, you were I, just saying? It feels yeah, like I, it's. Yeah, it could be a little different. I think what you have to remember is, you know, from an R and D, let's take a new product for instance. So okay. in that world of R and D, there's been lots and lots of testing done, and they've probably done those qualitative things where they've talked to people and done the focus groups, and then they've done their large-scale testing within the research 
um, community and they've probably they could have tested thousands of people. And then they, you know, you go to the large market research test or a Basie's test, right? And you're getting another, you know, hundred or so people, but you're always looking for subsets of people. It's always like a specific recruit, right? Now the yeah. bases will go to general population and they'll go, you know, different places within the country. Your R&D is usually more specific. I'm looking for a specific demographic or a certain behavior. You know, mm-hmm. I want someone who frequents this store or this brand or these brands or yeah. these products. You're never going to talk to everyone, right? So when that product does come to market and gets launched, you're exposing it now to people that you've never tested it with prior um, and what their beliefs and attitudes and usage of that product might be, might be something very different than what you originally intended. Um, and, uh, And so that information can be very valuable and can be very valuable early on as possible. Now I'll give you an example. Um, Oreo thins, maybe, you know, them, maybe your, um, viewers know Oreo thins. Well, Oreo thins was a product that was first launched in China. Hmm. Um, and it was specifically designed for consumers in China because three regular size Oreos was just too much of a, a serving. It's just too sweet. And it isn't something that, um, they typically do. Right. So we introduced Oreo Thins, and it went really, really well, okay? Um, And so then we're like, okay, well, let's bring it to the U.S., okay? And we're thinking, this is a great little product. It has the same experience of an Oreo, you know, but it's thin. What we didn't really think about was how people in the U.S. actually viewed the product as the Oreo experience with less calories. I mean, it mm. was never intended to be a product that, oh, I can have three of these and it's significantly less calories than three of the regular size ones. Um, and, and so, again, it wasn't what the product was intended. It was successful in China and we, and right. we tested it in the U.S. and people loved it and liked it and thought, hey, this is a, you know, a really good product. But we didn't actually... Um, think of it in the way that the consumer actually is using the product today. Got it. And that data came in from the (gasps) consumer relations, right? As people then started to communicate with us about the positives of the product and how it was being used, we didn't know. So it was like this new usage in a way. Yeah. Or benefit. The motivation for it was very different than than what we thought. Right. Yep. I think in conclusion, if I could just recap all that, that was, that's a great interesting story. I did not know about that. Um, is And my son is a huge user, as as am I, of the Oreo cookie. Um, but the double stuff, we'll say. We just go straight <laughs> for the double stuff at that point. But in conclusion here, yeah. I think what we're saying is, um, you know, even today, the consumer relations data is still valuable no matter what. Yep title you put on it, qualitative, what have you, um, Mm -hmm. there's, there's something to be learned there because you are opening up with none of those rules of who you're talking to. And it's just kind of coming in naturally from consumers. So good, good to hear confirmed by Marcia Young. Um, so the second question is, um, what are some of the ways that the consumer relations team can gather and share feedback with consumer insights? So we talked about the one example, which is like sort of the new product. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, if you can get granular and and give another example, that would be, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think that when you're working in, you know, uh, the company that the, um, the more people involved that have a vested interest and are going to be working with that product from start to finish should be aware and and knowledgeable. So Mm -hmm. I think that it would be really important that the consumer affairs people are part of the initial project team, right? They, in terms of understanding the, the consumers, what's going on in the world, what's the feedback we're getting right now on, on products, 
um, I think is very valuable to bring into those discussions. And also to be aware of, you know, products generally don't end up where they started, right? I mean, you don't have this vision of a, you know, little cookie or this biscuit, and it's going to exactly be what you envisioned in the end. Things change. You get that consumer feedback. Um, business priorities change. Maybe you need to cost save it. Maybe it needs to be made in a different plant. Um, so the more the consumer affairs people are involved and aware of all those discussions and the journey that the product goes on from start to finish, the any issues or challenges or conversations with the consumer post, I think, are more knowledgeable. Um, you know, you're able to garner insights from that to be able to synthesize, hey, this is an issue. We know that we changed this ingredient or we changed, you know, the plant that where this was going to be made and it changed the texture of this product. And now exactly what we thought was going to happen, we start to see that, you know, in the marketplace and seeing that in our data. So yeah. I think that it is important for people to be involved in understanding um, the new product process, wh what changes that product goes on. There's all kinds of inspections that go on at the bench, um, you know, trying samples, and people giving feedback to one another about, you know, what they taste, um, going through their, you know, when you get your data back from, let's just say, a consumer test, and you have the products there in front of you, and now you're looking at the data along with the products, having the consumer affairs people um, involved in that as well can be valuable for both them and the project team. Yeah. So I would, I would encourage, you know, people to be part of the project team, not like an afterthought or a service to it, but part of that team from the beginning. Gosh, yes, totally agree with that. I do, I do. And wondering, well, let me recap that first. I think yeah. the, the big aha there is is just ensuring that consumer relations is part of the or of the project and from the beginning. Um, and one of them was to anticipate potential, you know, concerns and like sort of leading from there. That would help consumer relations then work with marketing or R&D on building a robust FAQ to anticipate those thoughts and concerns and to see if there's a way the brand ambassadors can talk about that and hold consumers' hands. Because um, you never know, and maybe another iteration is in the works that's going to come out to, to the marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there's past, what I'm hearing too, is there's past information that consumer relations can can add to say, you know, inspections. And that is, oh, okay, when we launch this similar product or, you know, similar packaging, X, Y, and Z. So let's sort of anticipate that as we build this baby. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that is really the ideal situation for sure. I know some organizations, you don't have the bandwidth to do that. And, um, you know, or the marketers don't have that inspiration to 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 kind of read it, re reach out to consumer relations and say, "Come on in." So this kind of leading to my next question is, you know, what are what would be tactically a way that you can ensure that consumer relations is is connecting with consumer insights or um, R and D? Is any any thoughts there? Any tips? Yeah. Well, I think it will depend, of course, on how your organization is set up, right? So where does consumer relations sit in the organization? What is that reporting line? Um, does it naturally fit under, a, you know, an R&D quality, you know, banner? Is it in the quality organization? Is it the marketing organization? Is it in the R&D organization? So that you have to understand, you know, where, uh, where those natural tendencies are. And then I think that, you know, if um, uh, the, from a leadership perspective, I think sometimes it just has to start at the top. So the leader of yeah. consumer relations has to say, hey, this is where my team can add significant value into the overall business by being aware and part of these processes. And how do we make that happen? So sometimes, you know, it, it could be as easy as, you know, you know, a friend, you know, you have a good relationship right. with a product development leader or a director in product development. And you say, hey, 
I would like to, you know, be part of this or have my team mm-hmm. part of this because I think we can add value. And again, thinking about those relationships, right? Person's yeah. going to say, sure, of course, come, right? And so, right. you know, maybe you build a case from the bottom up in terms of what yeah. value did we play, what things happened, um, and then also going from, I think, the top down in terms of, so what is the vision of the consumer relations function? Is it how is it going to change over time, right? Insights has changed. Consumer science has changed. R&D has changed. I'm sure consumer relations has changed. And how is your leadership going to be looking at the Mm -hmm. vision for the future and what's important? Because things are changing with, I mean, if you think about digital (laughs) and where the world is. Every day, Marcia. Every day. And, you know. Children, seven, eight years old, having their own iPhones or having a smartphone and always online and always connected and, you know, between the Facebooks and the Instagrams, things are changing. So, you know, how we contact people and how we interact with people socially, it's changed a lot, (laughs) right, just in the recent past, and it's going to continue to change. And so what is that vision then for consumer affairs? along that journey as well. And so again, being more aware of what's going on within product development and R&D and why things are being developed the way they are, formulations and so forth is going to be important. Right. Excellent. Excellent advice. If you've learned even a kernel of an idea or was inspired by this episode, please consider rating and reviewing the podcast on Apple Podcast. Be sure to share out the hashtag CPGCX, because CPGCX really and truly rocks. You have been listening to the My Curious Colleague podcast with Denise Veneri. Thank you for your time.